Good morning, and welcome to today's swearing-in ceremony in honor of Dr. Mark T. Esper, the 23rd Secretary of the United States Army. Please stand for the arrival of the official party. The Secretary of Defense, James N. Mattis, and the Secretary of the Army, Mark T. Esper. Please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free, on the home of the brave? Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Secretary Esper and I, we, we couldn't sing, so we ended up in the infantry, but wasn't that a great uh, rendition? Uh, well done. No matter how many times you hear that song, you, you think about when it was written by that guy sitting on that ship out in the harbor watching the fort under attack. And uh, remember uh, who held that fort all the way through the night, General Milley, so thank you. Uh, first of all, Leah, to you, your sons and daughter, uh, I would just tell you, I know you weren't there, Mark, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would just tell you, uh, Luke and Jack and uh, Kate, uh, I think your mother is here, Polly. Welcome. You've got to be proud of your lad today, huh? He defied gravity. I know mothers often are worried about what their, their lads are up to. Uh, Director Pompeo, a special welcome to you, uh, back with your friend of many decades, but also the Army blood runs thick through you, and we have no, I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we have no finer shipmate, no finer comrade in arms here in DOD than the Director of CIA right now in a host of issues from the most obvious to the most unobvious. Uh, but uh, thanks for coming down today and for a partnership that's much thicker than any organizational chart uh, ever admits to. And for so many of you are here, the, uh, the family, the sisters, the nieces, the nephews, all of you coming in for this, it's a reminder that this is a family business, the protection of this country, and that that family runs even larger. So welcome back to your Army family. Also, General, it's good to see you and all the friends of the Army. Mira, thank you for coming. Good to have you back in the Pentagon. Our Undersecretary, our Secretary of the Air Force, uh, General Sullivan, you're still in the game, sir. It's, uh, it's heartening, sir, to have you back. Uh, the Coast Guard is here. Remind us that we have five armed services, not four, uh, something we often have to remind people about, Commandant. And I would just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that what we have together, I think uh, my senior enlisted advisor is here somewhere. Right here, sir. Uh, there he is. Okay, Sergeant Major, thank you. United States Army, extraordinaire. But I think as we look at this, uh, when we pause in our daily routine, it says something about the quality of the man uh, that is now joining our Secretary of Navy and Secretary of the Air Force in order to lead this critical component of our joint force. Uh, because we need someone like his returning, a native son of the U.S. Army, returning to his Army roots, so to speak, in the long gray line. 
Uh, and if you track Dr. Esper's experience, uh, 21 years in the United States Army, active in reserve. He's been in the 101st Airborne in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, although he had every reason to be in school. He, uh, I understand this attitude. He went truant uh, and did not go to the, uh, his professional schooling that year and found a way to be where every one of the Army's uh, red-blooded fighters would have wanted to have been. And along the way, he had ranger training. He was recognized with the Bronze Star. And I would just tell you that uh, retiring as a lieutenant colonel, that wasn't good enough for us. We're going to get our money's worth out of him now. Uh, he ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, the, uh, we have guards on the door, Mark, so you ain't going to nowhere, OK? You're, you're here. But you've also had, a, I would just call it a rigorous study apprenticeship in national security affairs, from Capitol Hill to defense industries. You've been through the academics. Uh, I appreciate very much your concern for intellectual property, which this country is bleeding out at an alarming rate, and how we're going to protect that for the good of our Army and our, our Defense Department. And I think, too, that this knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, is critical because what we are out to do right now is to make the U.S. military more lethal and more capable. And you need people who come in who can hit the ground running right away. You don't have to explain the difference between a core and a company. You don't have to go into it and talk about the spiritual side of serving. This is someone who has lived it, who has talked it, more importantly, one who has walked that in tough times. We don't choose leaders, of course, for this department. Uh, this is the varsity, this U.S. military. We don't choose leaders based on what they did in the past, however. That is all prelude. What we have here is someone that we are confident will take the Army forward, that has the right value system. We understand if something is not contributing to lethality, it's going to the dustbin of history, and it's going to go to the dustbin of history very, very quickly. I won't mince words. The inter international security situation is certainly the most complex uh, that I've seen in over 40 years of uh, dealing with it, and it's certainly more demanding. And we are going to answer that with those three lines of effort that many in this room have heard repeatedly. Number one, make the military more lethal. Number two, we are going to strengthen our alliances because nations with allies thrive and nations without allies do not. And we are going to reform the business practices. And Deputy Secretary of Defense Shanahan is here. And he comes in from Boeing with a wealth of experience, how you run big organizations, how you take difficult, complex processes and put them at the top of the international game. And uh, I would just tell you that he is a godsend to us and to our service secretaries who will find in him the most cunning and capable leader from budgets to programs to how we actually turn pragmatic success inside the department to success out at the forward lines. We were talking earlier in my office, I just signed yet another next to kin letter to a soldier, and that family has a seven-year-old daughter. So what we're doing is absolutely critical, and we're going to have to have the varsity year mark, you're the varsity, and you're a welcome site uh, for sore eyes. Uh, I would also point out that, uh, that there is no right side of history. I want to make a statement about this because too many times I've heard certain uh, malcontents or, or people who are up to mischief or murder or mayhem uh, dismiss it. Well, they're on the wrong side of history. I've read enough history to know history is written by the good guys and the bad guys, and we're going to have to take decisions in this country today, like every generation in the past, that says we're all Americans, this is a nonpartisan issue, the defense of our values, our way of life, our people, and the bottom line is the virtuous and vile alike of written history, but let's remember here today that we're the good guys, we're not the perfect guys, and we'll straighten that up, and this is the person who's going to take us forward in the U.S. Army. We can send the Navy places, and I can get away with murder, frankly, with the naval forces, because uh, other countries say that's easy, they're over the horizon, they're there, they reinforce us, that sort of thing. We can fly over countries as well and reinforce their confidence and say, we hold the high ground with you. But when the U.S. Army comes, what you're saying is America's putting itself on the line. That's the bottom line. The Army has, in years gone by, uh, been lost 
more troops. They've done more of the fighting and more of the bleeding for this country than any service, and to have the Army at the top of its game is critical. There's a historian from Texas, his name's Fehrenbach, and he said, without its tough spearmen, <coughs> Hellenic culture would have had nothing to give the world. It would not have lasted long enough. And so let me just uh, say that from Lexington to Bastogne to the Korangal, it's been the U.S. Army who stood through the good times and especially the bad times and been our last best hope in a troubled world. And I know that you're going to keep us feared by our adversaries and reassure our allies as they know when you show up, uh, then the varsity's there with them and they're going to make it. They'll find their manhood and fight harder alongside us. Uh, we are, uh, Leah, we are going to uh, cut Mark's pay by 80%. Uh, we will work him three times as hard. Uh, he will work late, and uh, you won't have to worry about holidays. There are none. Uh, but uh, I just tell you that uh, we are grateful to you and the family and you young people. Uh, we're under no illusions about this. This Army's been tested. Uh, it stood the strain, but it stood it because we have patriotic young people who are willing to put their lives on the line. And even you're young compared to me, Dr. Esper, so I'm speaking to you too. So thanks for loaning uh, your father, uh, your husband to us uh, for this. Uh, he's going to ride for the brand because that's what's in his DNA. And we know that since loyalty only counts when there's a hundred reasons to not be loyal, well, we know you'll be there when the, when the chips are down. So it's a pleasure to serve alongside you. And Leah, if you would come forward with your number one fella, we'll do the honor here. I state your full name. I, Mark Esper, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, and without any mental reservation, for a purpose of evasion, for a purpose of evasion, that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties, that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, on the office of upon which we're about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for those very kind and very, very generous words. I, I deeply appreciate them, and I appreciate the fact, even more so, that you're here today, that you're taking time out of your busy schedule. You have the weight of the world upon your shoulders, and, uh, and it means a lot to me and my family that you would take the time to do this today. Uh, I also want to thank a number of distinguished visitor, visitors here today. As I, as I look around the room, I'm sure I will fall short, uh, but I do want to recognize uh, Director Pompeo, uh, my old friend and West Point classmate. Thank you for being here today. Uh, Deputy Sec Dep uh, of Defense uh, Shanahan, Pat, it's good to have you here. We worked together in the past, and I'm excited about working with you again. I can continue to go down the line with my uh, colleague, Air Force Secretary Heather Wilson, uh, but there are any number of undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, the chief of staff, the Army G general officers, uh, Hill friends, think tank friends, uh, Army friends. Uh, I think my West Point uh, roommate is here as well from a year came all the way from California. If you talk to him, he's a liar. Don't believe him. Uh, <laughs> But I really want to thank all of you for coming here today and sharing this very uh, special moment for me and my family. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't call out uh, publicly my wife, Leah, who uh, we're now going on our 29th year of marriage. Uh, she was with me from the early days uh, when, when we were, I was a brand new lieutenant and, uh, and we were, I was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, she came in with no knowledge of the Army and within a, a short year, actually less than a year of marriage, uh, she saw me go off to war and leave her behind uh, for, for several months. and. It, um, quite an emotional event. Uh, but afterwards, she followed me throughout the Army, of course, for several years, ran my family readiness groups, uh, supported soldiers, volunteered, and do all the great things that um, Army spouses do. And to me, she really epitom epitomizes the sacrifice and support and the charity and, the, and all that our great military families do for us, regardless of service. And so I just want to publicly thank you again for all that you've done for me and, and allowing me to do this again. So thank you. I 
I don't want to uh, torture you all with a long scripted speech. Uh, I will save that for this afternoon at Fort Myer uh, for the Army welcome. So if you're able to make it, uh, you'll, you'll get that there. I, I do want to speak for a few minutes, make some remarks about the role, and, and thank a few uh, additional folks along the way. And I'll begin by saying that um, months before the election and certainly afterward, a number of people would come up to me and say, you know, Mark, are you interested in serving the executive branch again? Would you want to re return to public service? And of course I said yes, but there are three things that would weigh on that decision. And I always said it would depend on the job, it would depend on who I work for, and it would depend on who I work with. Because having worked in the executive branch a few times before, specifically in DOD, I know well that the hours are long, uh, that the, uh, the work is difficult, that the pay is not as good as the private sector, isn't that right, dear? <laughs> uh, but that it can also be re rewarding. And the fulcrum of that decision really comes down to those three questions that I would wait out in any type of, uh, in any type of final decision. And so it goes without saying that when Secretary of Defense Mattis was, was uh, sworn in and became the secretary, I couldn't have been more inspired and excited to work under his leadership and tutelage. Um, his reputation preceded him, and certainly once in office, and in the few weeks that I've been in office, I've come to deeply appreciate the value of the clarity that he offers us in terms of guidance, the importance he places on readiness and lethality, and his ge general direction and support that he gives the services. As a leader of the Army, I, I can't ask for more than that type of clar uh, clarity of thought, that guidance, and that support. It's critical to the tasks we, we have ahead of us. And again, Mr. Secretary, thank you again for, for all that and for your support for me to be the Secretary of the Army. The second question uh, had to deal with um, who I'm working with. And I, I got to tell you, I could not have picked a finer Army team, leadership team, to serve alongside. Whether it's Under Secretary McCarthy, who is a combat veteran, uh, a man with boundless energy, extensive knowledge of, of, of DOD, he's been a, a, a great counsel to me and a great undersecretary. Uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, Mark Milley, who, uh, who everyone knows well for his years of dedicated leadership his clarity in terms of what we need to do to prepare our troops for the critical war fighting missions. And I can go on and on about the Vice Chief, the Sergeant Major of the Army, and other general officers. Needless to say, Mr. Secretary, I want to assure you that we are all on the same, wave same wavelength in terms of, um, of what the Army needs to do. Uh, we all understand the rigors of wartime. We understand the importance of training, being prepared for combat. And we are all prepared to make sure that our country, our Army is ready uh, should we be, be, be called upon again. Uh, I would be remiss in, in that regard of not saying as well that I'm quite pleased and ecstatic about the team you've built at OSD and my fellow service secretaries. Uh, having Secretary Wilson and Secretary Spencer, I think um, we we've, uh, have a quick and easy rapport. I'm excited to work with them as well because I think in the tough days ahead that will likely be ahead, that that type of relationship is critical if we as a joint force are going to serve the nation well. Lastly, regard with, with regard to the job, the, the actual responsibility of Secretary of the Army. I, I can't think of any greater honor, uh, any greater privilege uh, than to be in this role. It is a homecoming for me in so many ways. Uh, the Secretary cited that uh, my early days as an 18-year-old uh, swearing a similar oath on the plane at West Point in 1982 when I first uh, entered the military. So in many ways I feel like I'm going back to my roots. Uh, I can't say enough about the, um, uh, the virtue of our soldiers, uh, their resi resiliency, and their willingness to take on the tough tasks um, uh, that lie ahead. Uh, the Secretary cited Fehrenbach uh, and his comment on, on warfare. Uh, Fehrenbach is more often cited as well for his seminal work on Korea called This, Ty this Kind of War. And in that, um, it talks about the importance of readiness in a conflict. In this one, of course, it was Korea. And as Director Pompeo and I know, it's something we studied at West Point. And as young officers, it was beaten to us, the importance of readiness. And the mantra that we carried out there was, no more task force smiths. And so I understand the importance of readiness, and it's something we face now and will continue to build upon, is building that force that's ready today and in the future. And so, Mr. Secretary, as we, we talk about priorities, as you know, I came into uh, in my nomination, I came into office with, with a few priorities. First and foremost was readiness, being prepared to, to fight that uh, hard, long, high-intensity conflict fight. Secondly, building the capacity and capabilities that we'll need for future fights, ensuring overmatch. Third, reform making sure we free up the time, the money, and man manpower to put in those other priorities. And then, of course, building those strategic partnerships, those alliances that will hold us well in any engagement, in any conflict, in any fight. On top of those focused priorities, I added two other things. 
the importance of taking care of our soldiers, our civilians, and their families, because they are the backbone of our service. Um, they are critical to what our soldiers do, and uh, we need to take care of them and make sure they are well led. And secondly, the importance of all of the Army, the Army family, recommitting itself to the Army's values, particularly leadership. I'm convinced, I've be become convinced over time, that a rededication of those values, treating everyone with dignity, with dignity and respect, and doing the right thing is what serves the Army, which serves the military and the country well in the long run. So with that, I will stop, and thank you all once again for being here, for sharing this very important moment with me, and for, uh, for all of your service as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Secretary Esper. Ladies and gentlemen, please join in the singing of the Army song. concludes today's ceremony. You are invited to come forward and congratulate Secretary Esper and his family. Thank you.